cacao had become an industrial product for the first time in its 4,000 or 5,000 or some say 15,000 year history. Um, for the rest of that time, chocolate was this, more or less. Uh, this is a woman named Karina Santiago who lives in Oaxaca, south of the city. She's a Zapotec woman. And um, when she talks about chocolate, she's, this is what she's thinking about and this is what she makes. So what you do is you, you take your cacao beans and you toast them, your kamal. Then you grind them up on your matate into a paste, and then you mix that paste with hot water. You froth the heck out of it, and we'll talk about that more. And, and then you make this very special drink that was a lot of work. It's two hours, uh, I can tell you, from the beginning of the process to the end. If you don't have a gringo trying to grind them, the beans in the middle, it might be an hour and 45 minutes, but <laughs> it's a long, long process. You put a lot of yourself into it, and at the end, you have this very special handmade thing that you present to somebody else. Um, and the Zapotec people have been doing chocolate for a few thousand years. The Maya have been doing chocolate for at least 4,000 years. In South America, there's evidence that people have been probably making chocolate or something else with cacao for at least 5,300 years. And it was always, if not ceremonial, then at least relational. Like, we have lots of evidence in the Maya texts that cacao was, was like standard at weddings. And partly, I think that had to do with um, this idea that the Maya had that um, when their ancestors died, they came back as cacao trees. Cacao grows really easily in the tropics. So your, your ancestors, especially your female ancestors, were sort of embodied in these cacao trees that you would have in your backyard or that forest. And so then the, um, when you took the seeds from those trees and you made this dark liquid um, out, out of them, then the, it was kind of like your bloodline. So if it was a wedding or if some, somebody special was coming over, then you were basically presenting them with your whole line. Like that was you in a cup. And especially if you've gone all this work to froth it. Um, there's some signs in some of the old Maya depictions that they would actually blow uh, to, to create the froth. Um, sometimes they'd have slaves blow to create the froth, but ideally it would be you because then like really you are enlivening the drink uh, that you present. So. Chocolate was, um, it was, it, it was, it just reinforced the whole social structure of the family, of the society. And it existed that way for a really long time. Every Maya king had a special chocolate cup. And this is a depiction of a cacao tree. This is in the um, Museum of the Popol Vuh in uh, Guatemala City. Uh, but you see it, it's just like standard iconography on all the Maya. Um, <laughs> Uh, both buildings and pottery, and and the lot of lot of um, accounts by both Maya and the Spanish once they arrived that it was um, it was very it was very ceremonial. So, um, so raise your hand if you've done a cacao ceremony. Anyone here done a cacao ceremony? No. Uh, these these are becoming a big deal. Cacao is finding its way back to the ceremonial um, ceremonial place in society, which I think is really interesting and kind of unexpected. Uh, but that goes way back. Um, this is not a, an image of a Maya priest. This is um, the closest I could get, which was uh, when I was in southern Mexico in Chiapas working on the book, I was um, working with the guy who worked, who was the government sort of extension agent for cacao. For those of you that know Terry Bradshaw, he's kind of like the Terry Bradshaw of Chiapas. Um, this is his brother, right? So. Um, on, like his brother has a theater group, so on weekends they, they like do cacao ceremonies and they dress up. And so if you need a, a shot of an ancient Maya cacao ceremony, it's about as close as you can go. Um, so as I said, for those of us in Western culture, cacao was kind of a, this commodified item. For people throughout time, it's been this, this relational item. But for most people who produce cacao in the world today, it is neither one. It is simply a way to survive. Um, and you all probably know a lot of this, but cacao is produced by like 20 million poor farmers throughout the tropics. Cacao only grows in the tropics. And most of them are in Africa, where 70% of, of the cacao comes from. But um, for most people, they have an acre or two of cacao, and their job is to harvest the pods, and they sell the seeds, and they make very little money. And um, for them, it is really, uh, you know, 
They can be invisible in this whole relationship, but one of the things that's happening now that we're getting away from the industrial model is they're becoming more visible, which is a good thing. So quick uh, cacao 101, like where, how, how do you, what is cacao and, and how do you turn it into chocolate? Uh, the cacao tree grows through the tropics and it has these pods. And because it lives in the tropics and doesn't have to worry about winter, it does things that are very strange to us from a, 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 a northern uh, agricultural perspective. It will have flowers, little pods and big pods on the tree all at once. It doesn't care about winter. Frost is not an issue. Um, and the pods grow right out of the trunk, um, which is very weird to us, but it's cool. Um, so, and so what you do to make chocolate is you, have, you just harvest the right pods and uh, collect them, open the pods, and inside are going to be about maybe 40 se uh, seeds, which are about the size of almonds, in this white pulp. So it's almost like a delicata squash, except the, the beans are bigger inside. And the chocolate is, is made out of those beans or seeds. But the um, key thing, which I'll touch on a couple times, is that to make decent chocolate, those seeds have to go through a whole fermentation process. If you don't do that, you get very boring, not very tasty, very astringent, bitter chocolate. Um, and that's fine, but if you want delicious chocolate, you have to go through this fermentation process. And um, one of the re part, part of the reasons that, that um, the new bean de bar uh, chocolate revolution has succeeded is because we've managed to transform the way that these beans are fermented. Uh, but that it takes some control. In most of the world, the people producing the uh, beans don't have any way of, of really creating a good fermentation. They don't have the infrastructure, the time, uh, so it doesn't get done well. It tends to get done more like this. You, you gather your seeds, put them in a, a container. You can either cover them with banana leaves uh, if you really don't have anything, or if you have a plastic bucket, that's, uh, that's probably one step up from the banana leaves, or one step down, depending on you know, what, what your standards are. Um, and then you've got to let them ferment for maybe a week or so. And in that time, uh, all that pulp, that sweet pulp, is going to quickly turn into alcohol, because it's the tropics and there's wild yeast everywhere that are eating it. And then that alcohol is going to turn into uh, acid because it's the tropics and there's acetobacter bacteria everywhere. So you get all those alcohols and all those acids and all this other stuff that probably we don't even understand. And that soaks into the beans and actually breaks open the cells of, of the beans and causes this whole molecular chain reaction that produces the flavors that we love as chocolate once it gets roasted. So it's, it's a pretty in-depth process. So when you have great chocolate, it means a lot of things have gone right along that path. And the last step is you have to dry it before it rots or, or it gets funky. Um, if you have a chocolate and it tastes like blue cheese, it's because maybe it didn't get dried right, right in time. But most people, again, have very little infrastructure, so they're just drying in their backyard. They don't add anything to the fermentation? No, it, the fermentation takes care of itself. And a def, like, Originally, it would have just happened spontaneously, and somebody realized, like, oh, that's pretty good, actually. Um, cause it, because it's that sweet pulp that sticks to the seeds, so it just, it's in the tropics, it just wants to ferment. Uh, in, in Mexico, if you've ever had those, those discs that you see in the markets in Mexico, that's a type of chocolate called lavado, like washed. They don't let it ferment. They wash the pulp off right away, just dry it, because they don't want to risk it rotting. But that means you don't really get like classic chocolate flavors out of it. It's just, it tends to be quite astringent, but it's also mixed with gobs of sugar, so you don't even notice. <laughs> so there's no sugar involved with the processes you're talking about? No sugar involved with this process, um, and you grind those beans, you're going to get 100% cacao, like basically baking chocolate. Uh, but, you know, if you're making a chocolate bar, then you're going to add sugar, and then you're going to grind it really fine, you know, to, with, a, with a machine that can do that to get well, that really smooth What texture. about that ceremonial beverage that you're talking about? So if you've got hot water, you don't have to worry about the grind so much. And that's partly why in Mexico those discs are really granular, because they drink chocolate. Like, all the cultures that started chocolate still tend to drink it, mostly. So they're not worried about that super fine texture. That's the thing that Europeans um, invented in the 1900s and kind of perfected in the uh, 2000s. Um, because Europeans were the ones looking to eat, like, a chocolate bar. 
So I got interested when these really good chocolates started appearing in the late 1990s, early 2000s. You guys probably remember, like, the, you know, in the co-op, you'd have, like, the, you know, the eco chocolate bar with the cute endangered animal on the on the label, and instead of the old chocolates, you were you know you basically had a choice between milk and dark. Suddenly you could get 60 percent, 65, 70. Like the cacao content was going way up, and sometimes that was a good thing. But also, a lot of those that that um, era of chocolates were being made with this, the same cheap cacao that's produced all over the world. So once they got up to like 65 to 70 the flaws became quite apparent. Like, they were intense, they were bitter, but they weren't necessarily that delicious. And then this other wave of chocolates came along that were super delicious, like with much more interesting flavors, and flavors that were all over the place. Like, some sort of classic fudgy chocolate flavors, but some that were much more, like, fruity or, or herbaceous. Uh, and, and I got curious. So I, was like, what? so I was like, why are these all different? Like, where does that come from? I was writing a book about terroir at the time. This seemed like a great, uh, great topic. So I started, like, you know, hanging out on all these super nerdy chocolate websites that were also appearing in that era of the early 2000s. And this one bar everyone was, was like, raving about. And it was called Cru Sauvage, being produced by a Swiss uh, chocolate maker that had been around forever, but with beans that, from Bolivia that they claimed were wild cacao, just coming wild from the Amazon. Um, and then some of the industry people on these websites were like, yeah, it can't be wild because there hasn't been any wild cacao in a thousand years. You know, it's domesticated, it's mostly farmed in Africa. Like, it's not wild. <laughs> so that, that, you know, it, it was like checking all the right boxes, like, mm, this could be a good story. So I ordered a bar. It was incredibly delicious mm -hmm. and different. Um, and um, so then I was like, sort of like looking for more information about it. And there was this one website called The Chocolate Life. And it was like a forum where people could participate. And a lot of industry people were participating. And this guy, this German guy named Volker Lehmann, was participating and was like, yeah, I'm the one getting those beans, and they're really wild. You industry people have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so that, again, was checking all my boxes. So I got in touch with Volker. I was like, you sure it's wild? He's like, yes, it's wild. And I actually need to go deeper in the forest to get a bunch more because the these, these Swiss company is... They're, it's a hit, and they need 45 tons, and I can't make enough. So I need to go deeper in the forest and talk to the people who live there and see if they will help harvest it for me. Do you want to go? So I was like, hello. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, so I, actually, Outside Magazine had just approached me. Uh, they'd read a story of mine, and they're like, do you want to write for Outside Magazine? Do you have anything really crazy and scary you want to do? And I was just like, I got nothing, you know? And then this came up, and it was actually the easiest story I ever sold. I just, you know wrote my editor and said, hard dark chocolate? And they're like, yeah, go, great. <laughs> so I sold it, and then I flew and met this guy, um, Volker, uh, and I'll, actually, I'll, um, so spo I'll do the spoiler here. He was totally right. Cacao is 100% native to the Amazon, um, but because it was, like, the great chocolate culture was developed by the Maya, the Aztec, and some of the other people of Mesoamerica up here, and then the Spanish arrived and encountered that, Everybody thought this is where cacao came from, that it was native to here. And it was only once we could um, do the genetic, tr you know, trace the genetics back, and you can tell um, where something originated, because usually that'll be like the, the place where there's the most diversity in the wild. And also you can just follow the family trees back and see where it started. Um, it started in the upper Amazon, right? You can see like this cluster here where Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru meet. This was the birthplace of the cacao tree. And, um, and then it spread out from there. People brought it by trade routes up to Central America. And yes, they developed the, the amazing culture of chocolate and cosmology involving chocolate. But they, they had gotten it from here somehow. And um, no one knows exactly how, but the, as the genetics has improved, we, we're starting to get a pretty strong sense of it. Um, you can see this cluster here. Uh, in the upper Amazon, um, and it, it started there, but once they traced back what are called the fine flavor cacaos, the cacaos that have these really amazing um, spice notes, it all goes back pretty much to, it looks like Peru and Ecuador, um, and this area in southern Peru, uh, this was like a, a presentation I just saw recently, install their slide. Um, <laughs> This, this area of southern Peru seems to be maybe the birth of, birthplace of these 
the several varieties that are considered like the most sought after. Um, so this guy in Bolivia that was harvesting them, seems like through people trading thousands of years ago, they then hopped over the Andes or down the Andes and went into Bolivia. But then more, more importantly, they went up the coast and then there were these trade routes along the coast because we have traces of cacao in, um, in pottery here from 5,300 years ago. And then it jumps up to southern Mexico, Chiapas, and we have uh, pottery with uh, cacao traces from 4,000 years ago. And it was clear that it was being used in a ceremonial context. So these guys must have been trading with each other. Um, and like, they, were, they were drinking some pretty damn good chocolate all up and down this coast here. Can I add to your trade route? Yeah. They found traces of uh, Chacao in Chaco Canyon in Arizona. Yes. With the Anazazi. Exactly. Yeah. Later, like a like um, a few thousand years later. But yeah. But so, um, to your point, cacao was highly sought after. It was actually used as a currency by all these cultures because the beans once dried would last forever. So it, it literally you could like you know you could buy a sandwich with your cacao beans. Um, not that they had sandwiches, but you could buy a tamale. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and then amazingly, like crossed a lot of desert and made it up to Chaco Canyon. Um, I think it was like 1080 or something, something like that. Uh, and then there's one other place. No one's been able to explain this part of the trade route, but um, somehow it made this this type this type of cacao called chuncho has also surfed in Hardwick, Vermont. Uh, so no one knows exactly whether it was like by you know, boats or what, but hopefully Mateo will be able to enlighten us. Um, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> it's a mystery. All right, so anyway, so back to the Amazon. So this guy Volker is like, it's wild, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get more. You can come. So I, was, I said, all right, sure, I'll come. Sorry, Mary, I'm, I just got to go, you know. Um, so I got there, and he, he was really living in the jungle, and... Um, he had this little little um, like grove of cacao, and he was making his own. But this was a pittance. He literally, like the Swiss guys said, we need 45 tons of dried cacao this year because everybody's screaming for these crucivage bars. So um, can you do it for us? Because otherwise, we'll find someone else who can. So he's like, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> so the only way, but it's not wild cacao. It's not like, it's not like a farm where you you just have like acres and acres, and you just like you know you've got your pods, and it's very organized. You just got to go find the trees, harvest the trees, somehow try to ferment the beans in the middle of the rainforest. Uh, it, it's, it's, the, the logistics are daunting, um, and you need a ton of people to help you, obviously. So, oh, this is, um, this is an aside, but this whole area turns out to be, um, like, what's wild? Uh, we now know that this part of the Amazon was an ancient civilization thousands of years ago with millions of people living there. And so, in a sense, it, a lot of it is actually regrown jungle. Um, so there are, and they used, uh, they didn't have any stone. So the traces are all just in the earth of what they built. But you fly over the area and you can see all, they, all these causeways and um, raised areas that they, and, and actual pyramids that they built. Uh, and what they had done is they basically engineered the whole landscape. Um, it floods normally for like three or four months a year. So tr it's, a lot of it is, is almost like the Everglades, you can't, trees can't grow there because it's too wet. So they literally raised up an area the size of the Everglades, um, and that was where they grew their crops, and then they farmed fish in the lower areas, and, and they had, it, anyway, it was a very elaborate civilization. Then they went away, and the forest grew back, and the cacao is still there that they were probably using. Um, so I get there, it's, it is indeed the rainy season, because um, that's when the, they tend to harvest the cacao. So you can see the, the river, this is the Mamaray River, was uh, full, but so was the forest. Like, sorry, sorry for any Vermont flashbacks, but like the, whole, um, the whole forest was underwater. So that, uh, we, we were in a small four-seater plane, and we were trying to meet these traders that had been trading for cacao with the people who live here. But in order to do that, we had to find a landing strip um, somewhere along the river to land and then meet up with our canoe. All the landing strips were, um, were underwater. Also, why were there so many landing strips in the jungle? I didn't think to ask that at the time, um, although I learned very shortly. Um, so this is the last picture I took but when, before I realized that we were actually going to be landing in that, uh, in that um, what once was a runway. 
or a landing strip, but it was like now overgrown with bushes this big. I thought it was like a reconnaissance run. Um, and then when I, I was like, oh shit, and I dropped my camera and uh, you know, grabbed the strap. The landing was actually pretty soft, but, um, but then immediately, you know, the pilot said get out and flew away. Four guys came out of this cabin that was down near the river uh, with guns and said, we're guarding this for our boss. He's a Colombian man and he doesn't like people landing on his landing strip, especially two gringos because it means you guys are probably DEA. And so anyway, this whole conversation in Spanish ensued where Volker was like, we're not DNA, DEA, we're, um, we're looking for heirloom chocolate, cacao. And they're like, ah, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> so, they, so anyway, ultimately they said, we, well, you got to pay us a landing fee. And we said, absolutely, that's fair, very fair. Um, and they said, have a 750 bucks. And um, I thought, that's, you know, the circumstances. <laughs> oh, that's okay. But Volker, who's been doing this for 30 years, um, said, how about 75 bucks? And I thought, that seems very low to me. <laughs> but they immediately were like, done. So they took our 75 bucks. And they're like, do you need any water for your trip? And they handed us a couple bottles of water um, and a John Grisham paperback that was in English and somebody had to left in the cabin. Um, somebody who didn't need it anymore. Uh, anyway, so everyone's friends, and then the, the, the trader showed up in the canoe, and everyone knew everyone, of course, and it was all fine. Um, so off we went in our, um, in our canoe, um, and up and down the river, there were, just, there were people who were harvesting cacao, and it was just like growing. Because it was flooded, you could actually divert off the river into the forest in your canoe mm -hmm. and pick cacao pods, and that's what people were doing. Um, so they just harvest it, and normally they sell to these traders that we were with for ridiculously low prices, like pennies. Uh, and it just gets consumed locally. Um, but, uh, so this guy Volker, his whole deal was he'd been working for NGOs for 30 years to try to um, basically create an economy that could exist in the standing forest so that you wouldn't have to cut down the forest for cattle ranches because that was the pressure that this part of the Amazon and a lot of other part of the Amazons are facing. Like, you can make more money off of cattle than you can off the forest, so it tends to get cut down. So the idea is, what can you grow in the forest and produce, you know, and turn it into enough money for the people to survive? So Brazil nuts were one thing they looked at, like certain herbs they looked at. Um, but cacao, like when he, when he discovered this wild cacao, he, like, which will happily grow in 100% shade in the understory of the rainforest, it was like, okay, that's the holy grail of protecting the rainforest, because it makes beautiful chocolate, and it's a natural part of this of this natural environment. Um, so that was the goal: is to um, to to turn that turn that cacao into really good good quality uh, beans, get a lot of money from, for it from bean to bar makers in the U.S. and Europe, and funnel that money back to the communities that live along the river. Um, but like. It was a mixed bag. Like not everybody was into it. Like this, I remember this woman. You know, like she was just like opening her pods on on the side of the river, and he would say, like, you see, these are these are rotten. So, if you're willing to, you know, go that one extra step and uh, open the, the pods, like get the pods like a day earlier or two days earlier, and then get them undercover and do these things, then you can get like ten times as much money. And she's like, yeah, I'm good, you know, <laughs> which was cool. I respected that. Um, <laughs> But the other people like were like, oh yeah, we actually need that. Um, and this, so this is a village we stayed at called Combate, and you can see like they're trying to dry these beans in flood season, and it's just not working very well. And this was very difficult. Like they they just don't have the in infrastructure to to take care of the beans, um, and they didn't have you know like the traders would show up once every two weeks or whatever and buy the beans. But it was just like the situation where. If you could improve all these things, it would be a game changer. So enough people got on board that it was a success. Made a lot of new friends. Uh, Volker ended up building these like excellent fermentation facilities uh, uh, in a few spots around the river. Uh, bought himself a 1964 Dodge Power with a cow skull <laughs> strapped to the front to cart the beans to the barge for their final trip, which would end up in a warehouse in Rotterdam eventually. Everybody was happy. He so borrowed a ton of money to do that. Though. He went around and got people to do all the work. Yeah, so he would like because you need you need hundreds 
for thousands of people involved to gather that much wild cacao from the forest. So it's like, you know, if you guys want to do this, we'll show up once a week. We'll send, up, send the boat and we'll pay you 10 times as much for this cacao. And it was the same traders who were doing it. It was like, they were all the middlemen, basically. Like, so you start with the traders and you're like, hey, we'll pay you guys 10 times as much, um, but it's got, the quality's got to be here and then, you know, everybody benefits. So that was the plan. Um, didn't work. Worked great for two or three years. Crucifage became famous. A lot of money got found with the Amazon. Um, but to do that in this like vast, vast stretch of jungle meant handing like thousands of dollars to a lot of people you didn't know very well, and they were going out to like get their twenty people to do it. And eventually, the money went out into the forest, and the bees didn't come back. <laughs> And, me, and to do it, Volker had borrowed from Bolivians at like loan shark prices and couldn't pay them back and said, how about you know, we renegotiate the deal? And they're like, how about we take your car and your house and it, it, everything? So he, he lost everything, went bankrupt, um, wife divorced him, burned out on, on chocolate and walked away to Costa Rica, a broken man. But that's not the end of the story. Um, so, <clears throat> that, for me, I thought that was the end of the story. But then, this whole new wave of, um, of bean to bar chocolate makers arrived, partly inspired by, by like, the stories of these incredible cacaos that could be found in the jungle. Um, and, so, and they started doing it differently, um, partly because they had more help, partly because they, were just, they weren't working with big Swiss companies, they were all little tiny players. And um, they kind of started from the ground up and decided to like, see if they could build, build this thing out. Uh, and then a, a group called the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Fund was formed, partly by the USDA, which for some reason cares that cacao genetics don't get too bottlenecked. Um, so USDA kicked in some money to pr preserve all these heirloom cacaos that were out there because um, they're really worried that um, the very few varieties of high-yielding, low-flavor cacao that were being used throughout the industry, like some disease would come along and wipe out what was basically a monocrop, and we wouldn't have any backup. Same thing that's that happened with bananas a couple times. Uh, so anyway, so suddenly, there were all these new players in the game. Um, and one of them was this uh, a young Brazilian woman named Luisa Abram. Uh, and she, uh, she named to Brazil. And she's a chocolate maker herself, so she didn't have to deal with trying to please some European 150-year-old chocolate empire. She just had this little tiny uh, chocolate factory in Sao Paulo, and when she learned about wild chocolate, she decided she wanted to only work with wild chocolate and make a different bar from every river of the Amazon in Brazil, working with the people in that river to like, produce their chocolate that would be specific to that place, both in the terroir and um, to the people. So that's what she started doing, um, and this is Louisa. So that's what she, she, she goes river to river and um, just starts with conversations. And she's actually, part of the reason she's made it work so well is she's teamed up with this group called SOS Amazonia, which is a nonprofit that works throughout the Amazon to kind of do the same thing. Like their goal is to find uh, local economies that can keep the people on the river, like basically living the lives they've always lived um, without the cattle coming or other thing, or drugs coming in, which is the other big issue everywhere. And then they actually got started, um, the guy, the rubber, Chico Mendez, do you guys remember Chico Mendez in the 80s? He kind of organized all the rubber tappers in, in, in the Amazon. He was an activist. Um, so formed, formed unions of rubber tappers to demand for better rights. And this being Brazil, got killed for it. So SOS Amazonia actually came out of that movement um, and they still work with rubber a little bit, but the idea is just to get the people who live there any sort of stability. Because um, they're not, like, fishing is, is one of the other big things that, that um, the people in the Amazon do for money, and the fishing is declining for all the reasons you can think of, climate change and so on. Um, the rubber, not, not a very lucrative market at the, at the moment. So the cacao, for the, they're, they're really interested in cacao as um, something that's, that can kind of uh, save them at this point. So again, so what you do then is you fly to the closest um, place that has an airport nearby, and you hop on these river boats. And this is on the Jirois River, uh, which is here. Uh, here's the main stem of the Amazon. 
Uh, Louisa makes a chocolate on the Jarois, on the Perus, another one on the Tocantins, uh, on the Jari, two or three others, and she's got a couple more coming. Um, but so she has to like constantly be moving around and meeting with everyone and making sure uh, everybody's on board. Uh, Waffer is another one she does. Uh, so what that involves is a lot of hours on rivers, and you go you're in the middle of nowhere, and until you get like at each little tiny community on the river, that's those are the people who you need to like convince that is is you know to get on board. This is uh, the, the you know the little uh, settlement that we stayed at, um, and it you know like there might only be twelve or fifteen people here, uh, but that's still that means that's enough that if it's worth it to them. They, and they tend to know where the cacao trees are because the cacao, it, this is truly wild cacao, so the trees are just like sort of spotty here and there on the river. So you really, it has to be an entire community effort. Um, and you can see what a remote area this is. This, we had a drone with us. Um, this is an old oxbow on the river, but that's it. That, that, you know, and this is like somebody's relative, and then that's it. And you have to go a mile to get to the next group of houses. But these guys were into it. They definitely, they could see that they're, they're um, Lifestyle is going to change if um, if something didn't change. So the the, the days before we'd arrived, they knew we were coming, and they're incredibly good carpenters. So they had just uh, you know like cut down some trees and in a day thrown up a shed. And meanwhile, other people had gone and harvested forty two hundred cacao pods, so they'd be ready when we got there. So Louisa was like, "All right, let's let's start the workshop immediately." So first first. Um, she taught us all how to, you know, you open the pods, take out the beans, and then you have to ferment them. So we all spent a day doing that. Um, and then you, uh, they had also built these great fermentation boxes with this tropical hardwood that insulates really well. Um, so then you, you get the beans all together. It's almost like composting. You need that, that critical mass of heat to really kickstart the fermentation, uh, cover it with banana leaves. Uh, and then at, you have to turn it every day to make sure it's all even and not neither too hot nor too cold. And then after a week of fermentation, then you have to dry the beans. And they had also just built this uh, um, little drying area with a little roller shed roof that could go over the beans because it rains every two hours. So drying the beans is a constant challenge in the Amazon. And then the next thing is getting everyone on board. So then uh, that was actually the, the fairly short part of it. The next few days were spent just meeting with everyone and seeing, you know, what they did to make a living and if this would help. So a lot of conversation, a lot of long conversations, and it, it's working. So she's got about nine chocolates on the market. Um, she's expanding uh, her her factory. She just got a better, um, fancy Italian ball mill, so she can make really really fine chocolate. Her sister is working in the company. Her dad and mom are working in the company. The packaging is. Packaging's so good. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah gorgeous. They've got, it's got so that Brazilian flair. Um, yeah, she's got about nine, uh, nine, nine bars. Um, and then, of course, be besides her, like, behind her are all these people uh, on the river who uh, it's making a big difference for them. What did they do before this? So it was either fishing, which is going down, or the other thing is um, there, it's called muru muru. It's these spiky coconuts. Like there's these palm trees that have like vicious spikes. It looks like something out of like Hieronymus Bosch, uh, and the the nuts have spikes too. But it's a high quality cosmetic oil. So the other thing to do is gather muru nuts, which turns you into a pincushion pincushion every time. Um, and uh, I know from experience. And it's and it's like pennies. It's like a ridiculously low amount of money. Um, but so so cacao is a huge upgrade from. Muru, muru nuts. They love to fish. If, if the fishing was perfect, they probably would be less interested in cacao. But um, the fishing is, uh, is going down, and actually the drug trade has now taken over the fishing trade. So mm -hmm. it's just ugly. Like, remember that journalist who was killed? Um, mm -hmm. Dom, I can't remember what his last name was. Uh, it was like a few miles away. From, it was the same area. Can anything be done with the pulp? That was my question. Yeah, um, great question. Um, they're, they're looking at that. There's a lot of, like, right now it gets thrown in the jungle, um, and it, you know, it breaks down pretty quickly. You said it was sweet? Oh, the pulp. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the husks. Well, yeah. They're, they're trying to, like, a lot of the weight is in the husks, so mm -hmm. everyone's trying to figure out what to do with the husks. The pulp, it, it turns into alcohol, 
right away. Okay, I guess I mean the, the husk, which looks to me like a, a pumpkin or something. Like, right, it is. It's kind of like that same uh, like fibrous, foamy texture. Um, do you have any ideas on the, on the husk? Yeah, well, the husk is actually an essential part of the creating a proper environment for the pollinating insects. So a lot of times they'll just keep them in the field, and that's actually going to help the uh, ecosystem in terms of providing that habitat. Um, the husk is used, actually, interestingly enough, in Peru, they often will dry the husk until um, it's really kind of bone dry, almost like this, and then they'll burn it, and they'll use the ashes um, to make kind of like this little paste that they'll use to chew the coca leaf. Then this isn't the coca leaf that they're using for you know, massive like cocaine production. This is just a traditional cer ceremonial use of the coca leaf, and it requires an alkalizing agent to use. So oftentimes they'll dry the coca pod, um, the cacao pods, and then they'll burn them to create this ash, and then use that to activate the coca leaf. But most of the, yeah, in in many respects, it's kind of being lost, but it's also an important part of keeping it uh, in the ecosystem. I did meet this guy once who was working on the NGO in Ghana, and he was telling me about how they're going to collect all the cocoa pods and then use them in some sort of like bio process to create like a sustainable firewood, blah, blah, blah. And I just kept thinking that they're removing all of this mm -hmm. material from the fields where it would traditionally have been left heaped up because, like Rowan's saying, most of the weight's in the pod. So if you're going to transport this stuff to the fermentation facility, you're going to transport it long ways, you're going to crack them open in the field and just transport what you need. Um, so I was just kept thinking about these millions of tons of pods mm -hmm. getting taken off the farm and thinking what, what potential adverse effects that could have down the line. Right, yeah, it, did, it does make a lot of sense to return though. But yeah, there's all these biotech uh, groups coming along who are like, we can, we, we can turn this into something, but. There's a company called Blue Stripes that you might see and they sell cacao water, cacao juice. Um, mm -hmm. So that's actually coming from the pulp, uh, I believe from farms in Ecuador. So you might even be, I think I even seen it at the co-op here in Montpelier. Um, and they say they're also using the shell of the cacao, but also the husk, some sort of fruit powder from the husk as well. So, yeah, there's but people don't eat it. It's not a the pulp is delicious. Like that, and that was, uh, like down there when you're walking around with people in the jungle, you know, they'll just kind of absentmindedly absent grab a pod, crack it open on a trunk, and just you scoop the whole thing in your mouth. And you spit out the seeds. Mm -hmm. So probably people were doing that for mm -hmm. tens of thousands of years, and then somebody was kind of like, "I think we can do anything with these seeds." <laughs> but the pulp's good, and then it turns into um, wine, which is really good, and then it turns into vinegar, which is like a sherry vinegar. And once it gets a little age on it, it's delicious. But nobody's really um, collecting it and shipping it up here. It's just like too complicated. But I think that that's a great potential product that something. But anyway, um, yeah, um, as Ms. Mateo was saying, um, it's like with the, the pods going back, like it's, it's a great environment. Cacao trees help create this great environment, um, and that's really getting recognized as a potential uh, rainforest restoration vehicle. So the Smithsonian just created a bird-friendly cocoa program to certify um, forests, either farms or forests that are managed in a way that uh, really support wildlife. And cacao forests can be can have as much bird diversity as totally wild forests. And it's all because they can grow in the understory, so they always have shade trees above them. They need shade trees. Uh, so they can be actually a great force for uh, reforestation, even though in Africa they've been a force for deforestation because wild forests have been cleared to plant like monocrops. So I think cacao is about to become, this, it's, it's about to turn, you know, from the dark industrial child slavery days into this whole, um, you know, in, this crop that is all about restoration at every level, um, including the, the relational. So I think that's the heart of it. What, like with this whole um, ceremonial cacao movement, what I see happening there even though now it's sort of in more of a, a like a modern new age trapping, it's still the same same impulse from thousands of years ago that people had. Like something about this stuff that makes you feel good. Um, it it like it's all about bringing people together to share in different uh, ways. It's it's something special that you use to 
give to someone else and create a moment of specialness. Uh, so, on that moment, I'm going to pass the, the cacao pod to Mateo and pass the, the phone. Questions while this is loading up. How many pods does it take to make a bar of chocolate? <laughs> that definitely depends on the cacao pod. So, for example, this one, this one's probably a little bit more of a smaller variety. There's some in Peru I've seen almost like the size of like a large like goose egg or something. Uh, this might have 20, 30 beans. Um, might have larger pods. You'll see in some of the photos. You know, maybe about almost like rugby size or you know, small football size. Um, so those might have 60, 70 beans. It really depends also on the size of the bar too. Um, but you could be thinking about maybe three or four of these, or you know, a few couple, couple larger ones. Um, also depends on what else you add to the bar. If you have like a 50% cacao bar, it's going to take a lot less. If you do 75, 80%, it's going to be more cacao. Um, so yeah, definitely a big blessing to be here. I guess um, suffice it to say, when I was listening to this uh, po amazing podcast on wild chocolate, driving back and forth from Boston to Vermont, I was not expecting someday to be right here with Roman uh, from the podcast <laughs> doing presentations in my hometown, and I had no idea who was in Vermont until uh, all this showed up. So um, yeah, we're going to get it, do a little overview and go into the sensorial aspect as well of the night, and maybe taste some things, and that's why I came straight from the chocolate factory, and I got pretty much chocolate over all my clothes, but that's what it's like um, making chocolate uh, up here. So we're going to talk about um, cacao, um, but also these botanical relatives of cacao. So I guess before the night, who knew a little bit about cacao? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, yeah, I think we're learning more. Does anyone, knew, did, did, does anyone here know that cacao had cousins or it had <laughs> relatives? Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the cacao and its cousins, relatives of cacao, and uh, my company, Bells and Chocolate. Let's see. What's the... So this is actually kind of where I discovered cacao, which is also connected to the Amazon basin, um, Amazon jungle where Rowan was. But this is a slightly different region, and this is in southern Peru. Um, as you can tell, it looks a little different than those photos that Rowan showed, right? This is because this region they call the Ceja de Selva. Does anyone know what Ceja de Selva means? Something in the jungle. Yeah, so Selva is the jungle, and the Ceja is this right here. The eyebrow. So this is the, uh, the Ceja de Selva of Cusco, Peru. So this is the eyebrow of the jungle of Peru. It's not that lowland Amazon jungle flat for thousands of miles. Uh, it actually is where the Andes meets the Amazon. And so you get these really amazing, lush, jungle forest environment that's also Andean. Uh, so it's kind of mountainous. So this is a region called Okobamba. And I was farming, um, met some people, and ended up on this farm that's like a little on the other side of that waterfall, uh, this mountain. Also kind of a wild trip to get there. Um, usually crossing the river on this little like uh, cart to get you across. And so I believe this is one of the regions in this Ceja de Selva, this eyebrow of the jungle of southern Peru that grows cacao in some of the highest elevations of the world. Um, so cacao, like we just learned, is growing native to the Amazon jungle basin that's, you know, like 100 meters above sea level, right at sea level, depending on where you're growing it. Um, it can grow quite a bit high um, into the altitudes. Um, so in this region, some of the cacao farms I've seen are up to like 16 to 1700 meters above sea level. So we're talking about like a mile high, um, which is very unique and different. And some of those cacao trees that were planted a while back that maybe grew like really slowly, now because it's a little bit warmer at those altito altitudes, uh, can grow quite a bit higher and are actually producing fruit. So for the terroir nerds and the people, it's like a very unique aspect of being able to grow cacao in different conditions and it's going to taste different depending on where it's grown. 
so this is one of the first farmers that I met who was actually doing the process like Roman was talking about, really taking advantage of these really special cacao beans, these chuncho cacao beans. Do I have any Quechua speakers out there? You know, speak Quechua? <laughs> Chuncho is the, uh, in the Quechua language. So Quechua is the, actually the largest indigenous language of the Americas. Uh, there's about 14 million Quechua speakers between Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, and a little bit in Colombia, a little bit Argentina. Um, so in Quechua, Chuncho means native. So that's what they're saying, um, and they're more referring to like the native uh, people of the jungle. So the Quechua speakers kind of came down from the mountains and started trading with the Machiganga and the Pirush tribes and all these different peoples, and then they started growing cacao. So Ephraim Puma is a you know, descendant of the Incas, um, so he speaks Quechua, and he had this vision. He wants to like grow this chuncho cacao that everyone knows is really tasty, but he wanted to do it in a really good way, ferment it right, dry it right, even though no one else was doing it. So that, after searching around for a really long time, trying to do it myself, and realizing I'm up at these really high altitudes, it gets cold at night, and so the fermentation starts to take off, and then it gets really cold, and it crashes. It starts to take off, and it crashes, so you can't really get a proper fermentation unless you really have a good setup. But luckily, he was doing it the right way. So these are some of the first beans that I bought from him, these chuncho cacao beans. I did a Kickstarter for a previous company in 2016, and then made some chocolates with Eric at Somerville Chocolate in the Boston area and then flew back down to Peru and was able to taste some of uh, the chocolate with Ephraim. He never really had his cacao beans prepared in a chocolate that way, so that was really exciting part of the journey, connecting those two worlds. In 2019, I started Prophecy Chocolate, and so the vision is to connect these farmers and these people down uh, in South America, the emblematic bird being the condor, with the emblematic bird of North America, the eagle and all the plants and the people and the environment that grows up here in North America with the cacao and the botanical relatives of cacao, which we'll learn about from South America. So when we talk about botanical relatives, um, there's a whole classification system in, uh, in biology and it comes down to family genus species. And so in the traditional way that um, most botanists will uh, give plants like a binom binomial name. So they'll give it um, two names. Cacao is Theobroma cacao. So we're going to learn about other plants in the Theobroma genus. Um, just so you can get a sense of other plants in the same genus, like we're going to learn about other plants in the Theobroma genus of cacao, here are all plants in the same genus. And um, other than... Roman or Emma. Does anyone know what genus this is? Prunus. Prunus, you got it, yeah. So here's all plants in the same genus, they're all relatives, whereas Theobroma, the genus that cacao is in, has about 20 to 24 different um, species, depending on how it's classified. The Prunus genus has about 420 or more. So you can probably get a sense of uh, the peaches and the cherries, and the prunus americana, American plum, and then uh, maybe does anyone have any idea what these two ones are here? How about this one? Anyone, any guesses? This, this one's actually in the same genus as all these other prunus. Almonds. Almonds. So yeah, those are almonds. You can eat the fruit, but traditionally we eat the seed, as well as this one here. What's it, what do we got here? Apricot. So a lot of times the apricots will eat the seeds, but obviously the fruit's delicious. And then this one of my favorites grows right around here, wild. No. Oh, um, current? Uh, current? Close. Choke cherry. No. This is a choke cherry. Um, and, uh, no, this one's choke cherry. Um, which, I don't, I, Prunus, um, that, uh, Prunus virginiana maybe? I'm not exactly sure what um, the, sub, the species is, but this one is uh, another delicious plant in this genus of, um, of the Prunus, mm -hmm. which actually the natives people would use a lot. Um, grind it up with the seeds and all, and then make it into a really delicious patty, and you can eat it. So we did that some of that earlier this year. It's delicious. Um, here's another genus. Uh, what genus is this? Um, Allium. So yeah, they are, these are all plants in the Allium genus. Um, so we've got the ones that we all know, you know, the garlic, the onion, and what do we have here? Favorites. The wild ramps, um, you know, the leeks, the chives, the scallions, everything. So. Uh, imagine a world where all we had was garlic and then we didn't have all these other ones. Or imagine a world where we just knew 
uh, almonds, but we didn't know peaches and plums and cherries and all these delicious things. That's basically what's happening with cacao, because we only really know Theobroma cacao. This one right here, which is amazing. It does make chocolate. We all love that. But we don't really know any of these botanical relatives of cacao mm. until now, until tonight. <laughs> uh, so we're going to learn about them tonight a little bit. We'll taste some of them. And uh, so this is Theobroma cacao. Theobroma is uh, the food of the gods. You know? mm. So it was thought of as very uh, special by the Europeans who named it and obviously by the native people. Um, to go through a couple that we'll talk about, this is Theobroma bicolor, also known as Macambo, also known as Jaguar Cacao or Pataste. This is Copuasu, very popular in Brazil. Um, that's Cupuy, and I believe this one is Angustifolia. So all different Theobromas, and we'll start off with Theobroma Cacao. We all know it as Cacao or Coco. They're basically just different ways of saying it, depending on if you're a Spanish colony or English colony. Um, although we tend to think of cocoa as more processed, cocoa powder, cocoa butter, cocoa solids, and cacao being like the real thing, closer to the plant. But it does have different names, so we can see that it's native to the Americas, Southern Amazon, uh, South America and the Amazon, then Central America, by all the names that the native tribes would use for it. So the Shipibo Conibo people, called Torampi, Kemito is the name the Ashanika people use, and you can tell it has all sorts of different names depending on which tribe is using the cacao. And so it's obviously been used and appreciated by all these tribes uh, throughout the jungle regions. As you can tell, like Rowan mentioned, it's got the cauliflori, cauliflora, which flowers right on the trunks, which is a very unique quality, and produces these delicious fruits with the seeds. Um, and then, yeah, we obviously know right here what we're talking about, the native region to the Amazon. Interestingly enough, all the cacao is grown here. Um, not all of it, 70% about of the world's production is grown in Africa. Um, but there's a native crop right to this country in Ethiopia, which is another tropical coffee. And most of the coffee now, like 60-70% is grown in South America, so they kind of switched them up a little bit. Um, Brazil is the number one producer of coffee. Um, and Colombia used to be number two for a really long time, now it's Vietnam. But it's interesting how these tropical plants like to travel. Most of the cacao that I get, um, that we import directly from the farmers, comes from the southern region of Cusco. Cusco would be the capital city of the Incas. Um, it's known as the Ombligo del Mundo, it's like the belly button of the world, the navel of the world, really special place, high up in the Andes. Um, so they didn't really have cacao there, but if you just go above the Andes and down, or if you've been to Machu Picchu, or you've seen that river, Rio Vilcanota, or the Urubamba River, you just keep following that river down, and then you'll get to the region where they grow the cacao. Um, so this is actually the confluence of a couple rivers, um, and there's the regions in the Andes where they start to grow the cacao. At the higher elevations they'll grow stuff like coffee and avocados and certain citrus, certain bananas and uh, passion fruits, delicious passion fruits and then you get lower and lower and you get more cacao and more papayas and oranges and delicious things. This was a video but we'll skip through that one. So here's a bit of a visual about the, all the different varieties. This is a man named Rimberti Prudencio who I visited. These aren't all this heirloom variety of cacao. These are all different varieties that he's planted on his farm as kind of a genetic bank of all different varieties that have been grown uh, around the Americas. And so it's kind of an interesting visual about all the different varieties of cacao that we can find. So. As you can see, um, this is a, like a beautiful representation of what an old cacao tree looks like. This cacao tree was planted by seed. You know, traditionally they'd just be walking, they'd clear some land, they'd take a stick, poke a hole in the ground, throw in some seeds, step on it, and keep walking, do that again, do it again, do it again. Now most of the cacao in the world, like most of the fruits that we eat, is grafted. So probably 99% of the cacao we eat and the chocolate wheat comes from grafted plants, which keeps them a lot lower. 
Um, you know, keep some 10, 15, if you prune them properly, keep some really low. This is my buddy Waldir, way up in this tree, really tall, probably 80 so years old. So he's got to oh. pick the cacao, the, what they call a payana. Then they're going to harvest them. We already seen this step. This is a, another fermentation boxes. They do cut tests, so they cut them throughout the fermentation to determine how soon they want to take them out of the fermentation to dry them, depending on all sorts of different factors and what they're looking for. And then we got the drying set up. Uh, and then I, this is just one of my favorite quotes because a lot of people talk about like, oh, what is, uh, what's cacao good for? But I like Alexander von Humboldt, amazing explorer of the region and really respected the native people said, at no other time has nature concentrated such a wealth of valuable nourishment into such a small space as the cacao bean. Um, so there's whole books written about what's in the cacao bean. There's all these studies, but this is like pretty much sums it up for me. Uh, so that's the cacao. Next we're going to talk about um, not Theobroma cacao, but Theobroma bicolor, known as Macambo, Macambo. Um, that's what they call it in Peru, Macambo, Macambo. Up in Colombia they call it Maraca. Um, also they call it Macambo. And then in Central America, where it's been used traditionally, they call it pataste or patastle. And they also call it jaguar cacao. They call it balante. Because the, because the tree, they call this tree balante. And balam is the jaguar, and te is the tree. So for whatever reason, they associate this with the jaguar, probably maybe because of some of the styrations and like the visual effect of the macambo pod. Um, the ones in Central America I've seen are quite a bit smaller, maybe they're about this size. Um, some of the ones in Peru that we'll uh, take a look at here, uh, these are the seeds inside that we'll talk about. Um, they're almost like rugby size shapes, so they can be really big depending on like the sub-variety. Um, so um, the main, the main uh, benefit that we're going to look at with the macambo are these macambo seeds. And so I'm going to pass around a little bit of these the combo seeds, um, which don't have that uh, crazy bitterness that cacao has. So most of the time in Peru, where this uh, food will be eaten, they don't ferment it. Although it sometimes has been fermented in Central America, uh, it doesn't have those bitter compounds, it doesn't have the astringent compounds, so you can eat it kind of just fine. So I'm going to pass around, uh, you could just sprinkle one in here. This is, uh, we're going to pass around a couple. This one is roasted with coconut oil and sea salt. Um, and it's a savory macambo bean. I'll we'll pass it here and pass them around. Um, and it's pretty mild. Most people, um, you know, maybe you'll eat like a cacao bean. It's kind of like intense. This one, most people seem to enjoy it. Um, pretty light snack. And then I'm going to follow that up with a sweet one. This is a sweet macambo bean. We roast it, adding our. our uh, Touch of sweetness up here in Vermont with a little bit of maple, cinnamon, and vanilla. Have you roasted the olives? These are, um, so I get them in this form. It's basically slightly dried or dry roasted in Peru, and then I roast them with a little bit of oil and, and sea salt. Um, I do have one also produced um, by, a, by a friend who's working with some of these farmers, um, and uh, he provides me like this raw, sprouted macambo. Um, which is also a little bit unique. This is uh, Aile Quinteros and her husband. She is kind of like a pioneer in the world of macambo, or as she says it, macambo. So Aile Quinteros uh, lives in a region in northern Peru called Tarapoto, um, or that's a major city, the San Martin region, and also uh, endemic to Peru, native to Peru, is the amazing sacred crop of coca leaf, which they have used for a very long time, traditionally. Um, the farmers will use it quite often. Um, we'll chew it during the day, give us slow energy. Um, actually has the highest concentration of calcium of any plant in the world. So the coca leaf is really an amazing superfood that we can't get here. But it also has the highest concentration of, what else? The coca leaf. Cocaine. Cocaine. So, um, unfortunately, there's fields and fields of coca leaf that are grown with pesticides and herbicides and not in a sacred, ancient, traditional way, and her region had quite a bit of these. So, USAID went down with a program that, oh, we're going to create some alternative crops to help out the farmers, and in the lowlands, they were like, you're going to plant cacao. In the highlands, you're going to plant coffee. 
and people are going to love it, and they're going to buy it, and, and Ali was like, okay, that's cool, yeah, I'll plant some, but I'm going to plant Makambo, Makambo, although there wasn't really a big market for it, she was like, had this vision that she wanted to work with this native plant that she came to love, um, that grows in her region, and now the price of Macambo is just like skyrocketed. And so people in Peru and the specialty stores are starting to enjoy it. She obviously eats a lot of Macambo with her family and friends. And then, you know, when I'm importing Macambo beans directly from her, even if, even if the price of cacao just like skyrocketed, which it kind of tripled it overnight, um, basically, still the price of Macambo is quite a bit higher. So it's kind of interesting to create a little bit of very diversity in terms of the income by being able to grow Macambo as well. So um, here's kind of that other processing from my friend who's working with these farmers and they're sprouting the Macambo and then we get them. Um, and while the Macambo beans are great, what we also do is we work with um, the Macambo in a similar way that we'll make uh, with chocolate. So. Um, I failed to show you this. This is a brick of um, a pure 100% cacao, some of which was dr uh, consumed as a beverage last night in Hardwick. Um, <laughs> for our friends up there, we uh, did this talk. Um, and so this is 100% pure uh, chuncho cacao that we stone ground. In a similar way, we can also um, stone grind the macambo. So this is a um, pure stone grind macambo. And uh, obviously you can tell the difference Traditionally, in Central America, where there's kind of the, the biggest intact tradition of drinking chocolate, they would combine these often, the, the, the cacao with the pataste. Um, and it creates like a nice, really smooth, nutty beverage. Um, and also kind of has that yin-yang, kind of the light and the dark. Um, and a lot of people think that this was the original white chocolate. Like, uh -huh. our white chocolate today is just cocoa butter, but uh -huh. this was probably what... Um, so these ones we're actually going to drink tonight, um, but um, you can't eat it. These are unsweetened. Um, so it's bitter? Um, the cacao is going to be bitter. The macambo, just like the bean, it's gonna taste like doesn't that. really have much of yeah. that bitterness. Um, so I'm going to pass around now. This is a, uh, a macambo chocolate that I made. So it's not actually um, chocolate in the same sense that when we make chocolate, but this is made with those macambo beans. And then instead of just making a pure macambo to drink, I added some, um, some of our favorite ingredients. So this one has uh, some coconut, some maple, and local strawberries that I harvested from jo Joe's Brook Farm, um, organic strawberries that I freeze dried and then I ground them into the bar. Um, so this is kind of like potentially like the next uh, iteration of what chocolate or macambo could be. Um, and, you know, we've got actually, here I've also got a, a bar that I make. Um, this has gooseberries and red currants from my buddy David's farm at Elmore Roots up in, uh, in Elmore. And so there's all sorts of possibilities. Since the Macambo is such like a really good palate, it sort of takes on uh, all the different flavors that you combine it with. So we'll pass that around. When you drink it, is it 100%? that or is there like a milk or water base? Yeah, so we'll get to that, okay, but sorry. there, yeah, we'll definitely be adding more into it. If you just melt it, it's going to stay melted for a little bit and then it'll start to solidify again. But they will melt like right around skin temperature, so that's why the cocoa butter is the fat content of the cacao. When you press that out, it melts right at skin temperature, which is why it's very sought after in the cosmetic and the pharmaceutical industries. It has that really unique quality of maintaining solid at a really high temperature. And do you have to temper the mutumbo like you would a chocolate? Um, depends what you're looking for. For example, this is not tempered. The, that gooseberry macambo is tempered. And to help that process, I add a little bit of cocoa butter as well to make mm -hmm. um, that crystallization mm -hmm. possible. So let's see. We'll move on to um, another relative of cacao. And yeah, keep the questions coming at any point. Uh, if you have any questions, we can go to them. Here's um, one of my other favorites, Theobroma grandiflorum. So again, it's in the same genus, the Theobroma genus, the food of the gods, but this is the grandiflorum, the large flowered fruit. Um, these ones, these are uh, mostly consumed in Brazil, although they're somewhat popular in like the Amazon, Colombia, and now more popular in 
Peru. These are also all different native tribes' names for the Copuasu or the Grand Florum. This is what the pod looks like. It's a little bit less colorful than those bright reds and yellows that the cacao pod has. And interestingly enough, there's the morphology is a little bit different. The leaves are going to be a little bit larger on the Copuasu. This Copuasu pod, interestingly enough, when it ripens, it falls to the ground. When the cacao pod ripens, it doesn't fall to the ground. It stays on the tree. And then if no, no one does anything, it, it rots on the tree. And then you even open up some of those pods and the beans are, the seeds are all sprouted and everything, but then they'll just rot right there on the tree. So it gives us an indication that this cacao needs, needs us. Or it needs animals to enjoy that sweet sugary pulp, like the monkeys and the birds and the rodents, and they transport all those seeds all around. So there's kind of this built-in necessity for the plant to engage with animals around it. So it um, looks like this one's not growing on the trunk like the other <coughs> cacao is growing on the trunk of the tree? Yeah, so the cacao will also grow out on the branches. Um, I believe the Copuasu does the same thing where it will grow on the trunks. Um, but I might be wrong on that, actually. It might just grow on the um, on the second year growth. I think this one, the fruits, um, will grow on second year growth. And usually the trees are a bit taller. And so these pods will fall to the ground. They'll kind of go and collect them up every few days um, because you don't want to let the fruit on the, on the floor of the, um, of the forest and the jungle. They're going to start to permit and, uh, and go bad pretty quickly. What's the white stuff? These are ants um, carrying probably something. I, I don't, the Copuasu pod's a little bit thick, so they're not getting into the Copuasu pod. Um, but there's all sorts of animals in the tropics. This is Bernardo Wanka. So he's got like a little association of Copuasu farmers in southern Peru in the Madre de Dios region, right uh, on the border of Brazil. So they're actually learning a lot from the Brazilian farmers about how to cultivate the, the Copuasu. Uh, unlike the cacao, the Copuasu is uh, fermented, or sorry, unlike the macambo, which doesn't really need to be fermented, although some fermented macambo tastes amazing as well. Um, the, this Copuasu is fermented. Um, this, this is the, the sweet pulp. Um, you can see it here. This is kind of the prize of the Copuasu. In many regions, they'll have acai bowls, but they'll also have Copuasu bowls. Mm -hmm. So if you're ever with the possibility of ever trying a Copuasu bowl, it tastes amazing, super rich, kind of creamy, custardy, and delicious. Um, so inside are the seeds, which are also amazing. And it sort of carries a little bit of that similar essence. Uh, but for a long time, these are uh, mostly enjoyed by the pulp. But we've got the seeds here, um, and then we also stone grind these seeds just like we do cacao and macambo, and then we have like bricks of 100% copuasu. And um, so I think I'm going to pass around um, a couple of different things here. One of which is going to be, uh, we'll do this, ready? I'm going to pass around the uh, the Copuasu seeds, which are kind of like cacao seeds. They're a little bit rich and bitter and kind of intense. Um, I enjoy them. I put them in oatmeal or granola and stuff like that. You can just kind of smell it. It has almost like this rich rum uh, aroma. These have been fermented about nine days by this group in southern Peru, which is quite a bit longer than cacao is generally. You could smell it. You could eat one. Um, I'll show you that you can eat one that you didn't. Um, 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 and then I'm going to pass that around, and we're going to follow it up with a, with a Copuasu autumn spice that I made. So this is like a chocolate bar, but it's made with Copuasu. This, I believe, um, I know it doesn't have tree nuts. It, um, I, can, I can look up what it has. Does anyone have any specific allergies? No, nope. what's up, peanuts? No peanuts. Cashews. No cashews. I believe this is the Copuasu with maple with a little bit of coconut. I use local pumpkins, freeze dried the pumpkins, stone ground them into it. I believe with cinnamon, nutmeg, and vanilla. So this is going to turn into a uh, Copuasu bar. It's got a big drum of it back in the chocolate factory. So you can follow up the bitter Copuasu with like a Copuasu. Um, 
people who have chocolate, basically. How does the quality change from there to here through transport? Does that have an impact on it? Well, what they're sending us is, uh, when we import it, we import it in sacks like this. Um, now, if this was the only protection, it might uh, could get different aromas or flavors or could rehumidify while it's going through the tropics. The, we usually get them in a sealed, hermetic, hermetically sealed bag called the Green Pro Bag um, or Ecotech, which basically keeps the product at like a pretty standard, standard, um, standard, you know, protection. Uh, now they are dry to about six or seven percent moisture. The cacao beans. So they're not going to, they could last, you know, five, ten years, um, or potentially longer. They probably will start to wane, but the cocoa butter, the fat content, is extremely shelf-stable. So I've never smelled cocoa butter and be like, oh, that's rancid. Pretty much every other oil, any other vegetable fat that in the world that I've ever smelled, at some point, it would go rancid. Even like coconut oil or... You know, even shea butter actually, which has quite a bit of a high melting temperature as well, it stays solid really. They have never smelled cocoa butter go rancid, so for that reason I believe um, it is more shelf stable than other crops. Even coffee, like the, you know, really specialty coffee roasters, they want the coffee at like, you know, within 10 months of harvest or a year. Once it gets over a year, then like the notes start getting more woody and they start losing some of the, some of the notes. Um, and actually, I know a coffee roaster I used to work with in the Boston area, George Howell. He'd take his green coffee beans and put them in like a deep freezer, so he could have like a grand crew of like 2018 Mamuto from Kenya. Um, you don't really need that as much with the cacao, and it'll also store in this in this condition here. So we'll jump into our um, the fourth botanical relative, the fourth cousin of cacao, um, Theobroma, still the same genus, the food of the gods. Now this is Subnicanum. This is a, a smaller bean, um, a smaller pod um, that's mostly known as Kupui. So uh, one of the, well and then Cacao Rana. Does anyone know what Rana means in Spanish? Mm -hmm. Frog. Yeah, so they call it the, you know, the frog cacao because it's like really small, I suppose. And um, so this is the, uh, the Kupui right here. It's kind of similar to the Kopoa Do you notice that similarity there? Mm -hmm. The previous one that we just looked at? And these are the seeds, also kind of similar. They've done some research recently in uh, Brazil, and they've shown that the Kupui uh, might have been like the ancient relative of the, the, uh, the Kopoa And the Kopoa is actually a domesticated version of the Kupui, and they were probably domesticating it for larger fruit pulp sizes. And they said that happened like five to 8,000 years ago in the Amazon. So there's obviously a lot of undiscovered history of peoples in the Amazon region. So there's the kupui plant. I've also, um, um, I've also heard that this plant on the bark is sometimes used in certain um, kind of what you call it, plant medicine uh, experiences. Even some people I've heard adding it to ayahuasca, like that shamanic brew of the jungle. Although that's not common. But I have heard that, and they also use it uh, with hape, which is like a, a really strong tobacco snuff from the Amazon. Sometimes they'll use the, um, the bark of this tree. Um, so it has other uses, but as far as I know, this guy, Reynaldo Maita, in uh, central Peru, in the Satipo region, might be the only one that's actually cultivating the subnicanum, the kupui, on a scale where he's actually farming it. Um, and so that's where we import some of the kupui from. And as you can see, this is sort of like what it'll look like if an insect gets to the, or sorry, if a, you know, a monkey or a bird will get to the kupui and, uh, and enjoy it. Kind of like this, you'll sometimes be walking around in the cacao fields and you'll see a hole like this or a bit bigger and you look inside, oh, there's no seeds in there. So that might be, basically they have like little, little um, uh, roveadores, like uh, little squirrels and um, What's the squirrel thing? What are they called? Rodents. The rodents will kind of come in and eat a bunch of the frogs. But, um, so then, yeah, there's the kupui and doing more experiments with it. This kupui is extremely soft. So if I just do 100% ground kupui, it won't form up. It'll be like almost like a ganache, which is, tastes really interesting and amazing. I like it. But to form bricks like this, I add a little bit of cocoa butter so it so solidifies and then we can drink that as well. 
All right, so those are the four uh, theobromas that we're going to talk about today. And then now we'll kind of get into, um, I guess, get back to it. Like, what's chocolate? So chocolate, as far as I've been able to tell, comes, um, and there's a lot of different theories as to where that word comes from, chocolate. Uh, but as far as I understand, it comes from this word, chocolato. So this is a word in the Mexica language, or the Aztec people, um, they speak Nahuatl. Um, so in the Nahuatl language, when you see the X, it's usually like a sh. So like, uh, Choconosco, um, all, all different regions that you might, Oaxaca, um, usually it has kind of like that sort of sound to it. So, chocolatl is a compound word, so it's chocol and atl. So I know we didn't have any Quechua speakers, but do we have any Nahuatl speakers here? <laughs> no? um, but you might be able to guess, so chocol, what would that be referring to? Yeah, the cacao. So the shokul is either, the cacao, I've also seen it translated as bitter. Um, so this is either bitter or cacao. I think it probably has both meanings since the cacao is bitter. So we'll get the shokul, and then to get our chocolate, then we got the atl, the chocolatl. So does anyone have any sense of what the atl might be? Seeds, milk. You're close, you're all good. Not milk, but they wouldn't add milk because they didn't water. water. So the atl is the water. And so the chocolate, if chocolate comes from chocolate, and a big part of chocolate is the atl, I think we've been doing the chocolate all wrong. Um, even though you know, we make chocolate bars, I like chocolate for sure, but a big part of the chocolate is to melt it down and make drinks with. And I didn't think about this going into it, but this is actually my number one product in the chocolate company that I have is selling bricks, 100% pound, uh, pure cacao, and people will drink the cacao, like back in the day. So as you can tell, um, they had a lot of different preparation methods. Um, this is sort of one of the traditional ones to pour it, or you can mix it up, beat it up with these molinillos. Um, this is sort of like one of these traditional molinillos from Mexico. And so what you're doing is kind of mixing up the cacao and raising up some of that froth and that um, the bubbles and sort of making it almost like cappuccino-esque. Um, and so this was also used by a lot of the Europeans that came into contact with cacao. They were also drinking cacao. It was not until later that they were eating cacao. Um, and actually the Spanish were the first to kind of encounter the cacao. They brought it back. At first they didn't like it, but they had access to another amazing tropical plant from Southeast Asia that they were able to mix into it. And they were like, oh, now it's really good. <coughs> what was that plant? Sugar cane. The sugar cane. So they had the sugar cane. They had access to the sugar cane. They brought those two plants together from Asia and from the Americas, and then they really got a taste for it. And it was kind of this, this drink of the royalty. And they kept it a secret for a really long time. <laughs> and then I believe there was a royal marriage between like the Prince of Aragon and, and a family in, in France. And that's where the secret got out, and the French are really pissed about it. Um, but now they've embraced the cacao. Um, so, but these guys are actually um, under patent infringement, I believe. Um, currently, there's a case going on because a lot of people in the states are now um, uh, using this little machine to make their chocolate drinks. So, um, a lot of people will make their drinks with the Vitamix. Um, but we try to do it the traditional way, especially also at, at a, our shop up in Hardwick, Prophecy Chocolate. Um, so the question is, what do we do with all the theobromas? What do we do with all the chocolates? Um, we're going to drink them. And so we're going to make a drink tonight. Um, but the whole idea of what we're going to do is also combine the cacao with all these other plants. So this is kind of like the eagle portion. That we, get, we learned about the condors, the emblematic bird of North, South America, and the eagles. Um, we've got chaga, wild maine blueberries, and even vanillas, you know, up here in Mexico. Um, we've got marshmallow root and leaf and the chili peppers. Here's a couple farmers in upstate New York that have been growing herbs for a really long time. Matthias and Andrea, uh, Healing Spirits Herb Farm. So I've been working with them as well as some other people and trying to get as many kind of local ingredients in the cacao as possible. Um, so we'll make like a little bit of a beverage here. Um, and um, include some of those local ingredients as well. Um, but that's the whole idea is that cacao has all these amazing properties in and of itself. Like we learned from Humboldt, 
but in addition to all that it has, it actually potentiates everything that's mixed into it. So that's why I like have the cacao with your wedding ceremony. It's gonna potentiate and activate the wedding ceremony, but you include the chili, you know, the chili peppers and the vanilla, and it's gonna activate and potentiate those. The, the cacao has theobromine, that's a major alkaloid, it has it's a vasodilator, it opens up the blood vessels, it has all those healthy fats, it has all these antioxidants and the polyphenols, um, which are healthy in their own right, and they kind of potentiate what the cacao goes along with. Um, so we're going to make sort of like a traditional and modern take on, um, on, the, on the chocolate here. Um, chocolato. So I hear we have 100% cacao and macambo, and I'm just going to kind of shave it down a little bit um, and cut it up. This one's quite soft, um, and the cocoa uh, itself, the cacao, will have about 50% cocoa butter, so it's made, it has about 50% fat. This heirloom chucho variety, um, I found it has up to 55, almost, um, I've heard 60% um, cocoa butter. So the macambo does have um, quite a, uh, sorry, the, the chuncho cacao, this heirloom cacao, has quite a little bit of uh, cocoa butter and it makes it uh, very delicious, a lot different on um, texture. Um, so we'll add some macambo as well. Do you go around and do like chocolate ceremonies for? Weddings or something? I could see that becoming a thing. I don't have my headdress like that. Not my <laughs> more uh, no, I, I, I sometimes will like share cacao in like a, you know, somewhat of like a ceremonial aspect, but I don't like necessarily often have cacao ceremonies. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people that will now really enjoy those. Um, you know, they'll, this is like popular as a cacao ceremony. People will be drinking cacao. It's also popular to have like before yoga class or after yoga class, before meditation or with ecstatic dance. And so it's kind of like, what is a ceremony? For me, like life in, its, in itself is ceremonial. You know, this is maybe a ceremony too, you know. You get to be together and talk about chocolate and macambo. Um, and um, well, well, there potentially is or potentially wasn't like a specific ceremony with cacao at the center. This is like a cacao ceremony. Um, which is kind of debatable whether that was it. Um, it is kind of like a ceremonial part it's of a life. Part of, um, yeah. So there's a lot of different ways and there's a lot of different ideas in, uh, in the different uh, traditions about you know, what is a cacao ceremony, what's a traditional cacao ceremony. But now oftentimes it's, um, it's enjoyed quite a bit um, by lots of people. So um, let's see. Does anyone not like cinnamon? <laughs> you can say no. You can say yes. We can do no cinnamon. No cinnamon. No cinnamon. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so what um, what we want to do... It, it's too strong. It'll... Yeah, we want to taste it. Yeah. Yes. All right, so we've got, um, we've got the cacao and the macambo in here. And what we're going to do is, first step in the process is we're going to add some apple, right? So we're going to add the, uh, the water portion of this. Um, let's see here. No, I'm good. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what we're going to do um, is add this hot water and this is just going to do that first step of emulsifying and starting to melt out those fats, the natural fats that are in the macambo, macambo butter and the cocoa butter. Um, so now it's kind of just floating in that hot water. This is how a lot of people could make it at home, very simple. Um, and now I'm going to take the spoon and just start to mix it up. Now if I wanted to add any dry ingredients, I would have added them in before. Um, cinnamon, cardamom. Uh, traditionally they all had their, you know, their own spices, native different flowers as well. A lot of times the cacao and macambo would be consumed as a beverage with corn, corn flour. Um, or corn masa, just like what they make the tortillas with. So now that I mix this, this is just like a really nice, um, simple, um, kind of liquidy, chocolatey blend. And what we're going to do is we're going to add in a little bit more water now that it's all mixed up. And then... So let's see, we're going to add a little vanilla and um, let's see. 
Get a little vanilla in there. Now you could add your liquid ingredients. Um, I am going to add a little bit of maple syrup. Um, and this maple syrup is actually farmed um, by my friends Ben and Kim at Honest to Goodness Farms up in, I believe, Newark. Um, and they're still using the traditional method of like tapping the trees and using buckets and hauling them all over the place. And uh, just to make it exciting, I infused this one with kopuasu and vanilla as well. So now we'll get three theobromas in this drink um, and a little bit of sweetness from Vermont. Uh, let's see, that's good. Um, and then, but if you're at home, you can just kind of enjoy it like that and you could uh, mix it up and call it good. But if we're here and we want, um, and we want the, uh, the ancestors to come visit us, oftentimes the cacao is poured um, and it's kind of mixed up in a way where um, we're going to try and raise some of that froth. Now, um, when Rowan went down there, he also found out that a lot of the, uh, there's a lot of you know, specific techniques. There's a lot of plants that are used to help to raise, raise that foam. Um, and I heard recently from a woman from Mexico, and she was saying that you know, when we have our cacao ceremonies, or when we drink cacao, we make cacao, the, um, the, all these bubbles and all this foam are our ancestors. So like the more foam you have, the more ancestors are coming to drink and celebrate life with you in this cacao, in this beverage. So, um, yeah. So there's a, yeah, like I said, um, there's a way of traditionally you could kind of be pouring the cacao, um, and they usually use like large ceramic vessels, or it can be kind of frothed up and beaten. Um, I've even seen, and I believe they also kind of make the froth on the side, and then they make the chocolate, and then they top it off with with the uh, with the froth. So. No guarantees by the time this gets to you, it's going to have a big, thick head of foam, but that's kind of the idea is that we're sort of mixing that all in there. And is the idea that the foaming process releases the flavor? I, you know, I, I haven't necessarily heard, um, you know, in general, um, any sort of different you know, difference in texture is going to affect the way that the flavor is perceived. Um, so maybe there's a certain amount of the addition of that foam and that air that will affect the way that the flavors are being perceived. Uh -huh. uh, but I haven't necessarily heard you know, the people talk about it in that way that we're doing this because of the flavor. It seems like it's more of like a ceremonial spiritual aspect but usually those also have uh, you know effects on flavor so it looks meditative when you do yeah. I'm gonna pass these and then I'm gonna go around so you could take a cup and then uh, and then I'll fill you up a little bit. Or we could make another one too. If this ends up running out Thank you very we'll much. so how about caffeine? So okay good oh question. Um, the cacao naturally does have a little bit of caffeine. Usually mm. people um, yeah. Usually, yeah. People, yeah. usually people have the caffeine um, in cacao doesn't hit them quite in the same way. Um, the cacao also has theobromine. That's the major alkaloid that the cacao has. Uh, theobromine is a vasodilator. It's also um, it's also a xanthine alkaloid like. Want some more? Sure. Um, it's also xanthine alkaloid like the cacao, and. Um, there's uh there's three major alkaloids in <laughs> no, this is a real shuffle bottle. Vermont style. Yeah, it's really delicious. Um, so yeah, there's there's one more uh, alkaloid in the cacao. It's a uh, I just roasted it. Salt oil. Salt oil. 
So yeah, that's, it. that's pretty much what we have um, today, and obviously, I actually, um, once I got this the book, the Wild Chocolate book, it took me like a few, like a week to get through it every night before I got to just reading it, so I really enjoyed that book quite a bit. Um, so I know Roland has, and we've got some of those books here, and then we've got some different products that we make. Uh, we also do have a, a cafe up in Hardwick that's open one day a week. Um, and I'm actually, so that one's open 10 to 7. Um, it's on Main Street. It's where the old uh, co-op cafe was on the second floor on Fridays. That's going, I think the last day is December 21st. I'm going to be moving my production, just more focused on chocolate production and making making all these different products and that's going to be in Morrisville and I might do you know pop-ups here and there to have cafes but it's pretty much like if you come into our cafe we're like pouring drinks and you know sometimes we'll have the tamales and so you can mm. drink some cacao or macambo um, and enjoy a good time so yeah do, do we have time for questions how are you guys yeah. doing yeah. yeah. I'm not sure I want Hey, you're going to wholesale to the place you want to do it. Yeah. Where else do you sell? Do you sell this in Maryland? Yeah, so uh, I sell some of the bars at the uh, at the co-op here in, um, in Montpelier. And then also they started carrying some of the, um, I'm sure you got like samples over here, um, pecan butter and a kokwasu coconut mana. So this is a chocolate pecan butter made with that. Uh, heirloom cacao, oh, wow. um, and then this is a cocoa soup coconut mana. So this is kind of like our Nutella, but we use uh, heirloom uh, American pecans, which are grown organically in Missouri. Uh, and then this one, and maple and vanilla. So this has just four ingredients, so you don't have to feel bad. Like, if you eat a Nutella, you might feel bad to eat half a jar. <laughs> so if you eat half a jar, you'll be feeling great. <laughs> um, and this is the cocoa soup coconut mana, so this is coconut butter, so we stone ground uh, organic coconut shreds, and then add the cocoa a little bit of coconut sugar and vanilla. So I think these two are at the co-op locally, um, and then they have some of the chocolate bars. We do a like, big online, um, so I ship all around. Today Emma helps me out quite a bit, the shop, she's shipping orders left and right to um, Florida and all around the states. Um, so we do ship out, and then there's the co-op in Morrisville and Hardwick as well, and maybe at a local bookstore near you at some point soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions for, for either of us? And then we'll skip straight to the commercial. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, uh, when you were talking about wild, and I was thinking about this ancient, ancient, ancient use, you know, we know that the Aztecs didn't have gardens the way we have gardens, but they know where things were. So I'm wondering if these were wild or if these are really ones that have been there for a number of years, replanted themselves, or somebody spit the seed out and grew, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that's the, a question to ask about everything in the Amazon, like what's wild. You know, when you've got, like, it, I just was listening to this podcast um, with this um, archaeologist who specializes in those areas, and like those are now like the oldest signs of people in the Americas are from there, and it's crazy old. Like they're talking like twenty thousand years, twenty five thousand years. Um, so people have been interacting with that environment in a pretty substantial way for a really long time. So I feel like everything there is like the result of people and all the plants and animals together. To, to add a little bit to that, it's really interesting seeing those um, photos that you had up about the uh, settlements in Brazil, and it, it reminded me a lot of actually where the Aztec people, the Mexica people, their their homeland was um, uh, Lake Texcoco, or I think in um, Tenochtitlan, 
And so that's modern day Mexico City, it's a concrete jungle. But at one point, the Tenochtitlan was probably the most productive agricultural yeah. region of the entire world, potentially ever. Um, and so they had a similar system where they used chinampas, they call chinampas, they're raised garden beds mm -hmm. kept in by willows to hold the banks in and then canals running through mm -hmm. everywhere. And so they were growing massive amounts of food right in their capital city mm -hmm. on these raised um, mm -hmm. sort of plateaus that were accessible by canoe and they had smaller and larger causeways, almost like Venice, like everything was by water and by canal. And, um, and now it's like 98, 99% paved over, but there's still a few people in Mexico City um, um, in certain regions. Soshimilco. Yeah, Soshimilco, exactly. As we're looking for the name, right? That are still kind of practicing that traditional agriculture. And so potentially like the whole Amazon or maybe large parts of it were also terraformed in a certain way. They're moving the earth and, and working with the land in a certain way. So definitely a lot of mystery there. Well, they're finding, they're finding with the new technology, they're able to mm -hmm. scan down on the ground and finding these enormous cities and yeah. settlements that, that they didn't even know were there yeah. uh, up until very recently. That's the equivalent of like the eastern seaboard of the U.S. It's just like one yeah. city yeah. leading into another for right. hundreds of miles. Like yeah. what we think of suburbia is now jungle. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, they use that LIDAR technology to see what's under. But, you know, before that technology, you could be like, five feet away from like massive ruins, but it's just covered with plants. It just grows mm -hmm. back so quickly and you just have no idea. So even in like near Machu Picchu, like Machu Picchu was like rediscovered like hundred, a little over a hundred years ago by Hiram Bingham. There's like so many other hidden sites um, still waiting to be uncovered as well. Rowan, did you have Mateo with you in your whole book tour? I think you I just, wish. I think this whole show needs to go on the road, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, you Vermont, guys you guys are lucky privilege. on yeah. Yeah. You, Did you do this up in Hardwick? We did. That was our, our rehearsal. Last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did not spill a single drop of chocolate last I night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for the record. What other mammals eat the, the cacao? Like is are there larger mammals like deer or like pork? Papers or what? It, what's in the? Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I think mostly they're after that sweet pulp because the um, the seeds have the theobromine right. and that can't be um, metabolized by animals. That's why a lot of dogs will um, will die from eating chocolate because they can't metabolize that theobromine. Um, so mostly they're after the pulp. I believe it's mostly birds and rodents and monkeys. Um, I don't know if the tapirs can like climb up high enough, although it does grow in, near the trunks. Usually when the cacao is in the wild, from, from what I've seen, it, there's like sparse pods and they're usually higher up. Oh, okay. um, can I jump in on that one? Yeah, Because I think there's another angle to that. It kind of goes back to what we were just saying about some of the ancient uh, past there. Um, there used to be all these creatures in, in the Amazon environment millions of years ago uh, like glyptodonts, uh, like that could mm. easily swallow whole cacao pods. Yeah. When it, that cacao would have co-evolved with, uh -huh. um, so you know, like elephant-sized creatures. Right. Then they all got wiped out around the same time that we showed up, I think. But um, so I, so I, people suspect that those were the mm -hmm. original spreaders of, like mm -hmm. they would just swallow, mm -hmm. uh, just like like, like elephants. Avocados. Yeah, yeah, avocados. Yeah, giant sloths. Yeah, giant sloths. Right. Um, so they were, they were probably swallowing whole pods and distributing them, and then all those animals disappeared. So that now it really is on us, you know. We're, we're like the last ones who really distribute it widely. The guy who started the I forgot his name. The German guy. Volker. Did he really just? He it just it looked like such a you know, incredible project that he got going, and then it just... Yeah, well, he literally lost everything. He walked away, um, took a consulting gig uh, oh. with Conservation International uh, to pay back, to pay some of his debts. Um, and he's now back, um, as of like two years ago. He's, but this time, he's producing on a very small scale, just what he can personally do on his own little plot layer. So he's making like two tons of cacao a year. 
and yeah. selling it just to a couple bean to bar makers here in the U.S. In Costa Rica, still. No, in back in Bolivia. So yeah, as a, as an aside to that, his the name of his farm is Tranquilidad, mm -hmm. which is like tranquility. So he's probably done with the big trade. But it's funny. I have some friends in uh, Washington D.C. and they have a little chocolate company. And I sometimes help them by making chocolate because they're really small. And they got some beans, and they're like, "Oh, we got these really cool beans from Bolivia." And I was like, "No way!" <laughs> um, and it, it, the beans from Volker's farm. So oh, wow. I have like That's three funny. or four, like three or four buckets, probably like sixty That's pounds funny. of Volker's beans. <laughs> and right, and they talk like, oh, "I should have brought those beans." They're little, beans. right? They're really small. They yeah. look a lot like the chunch, like these heirloom chuncho cacao beans. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they're probably descendants of the chuncho. Connected for sure. Mm -hmm. how, does the, how does the uh, the farmers function with the corruption and? Political instability in these areas. I mean, do they, does the government help them, or does it get in their way? Or government definitely doesn't help that I've seen in, in uh, like the places that I live. Mexico, the government does. The government's pretty good. Um, Mexico is very proud of their their cacao heritage, um, and they're proud that of these you know ancient heirloom beans that they have that go go way back. So there's both com a lot of uh, commercial demand for the heirlooms and uh, government definitely does. The cartel like, hasn't taken over like they have avocados, for example? They haven't because there's no friggin' money in it. <laughs> the, the saving grace of cacao is like, it's like commercially terrible. <laughs> so um, I haven't seen, um, what I saw in Bolivia is that when the drug trade comes, the drug trade is almost like the Amazon River itself. Like it keeps, it jumps its banks and like finds new ways through the jungle, like different towns. And when the drug trade comes through the town, everyone stops working with cacao because because the drugs are worth mm -hmm. so much more money. Mm -hmm. But then every, that goes to hell in a few years, and then the cacao is still there, so they come back to cacao after that. Um, but did, I don't know in Peru is it? Uh, yeah, so I mean the story is like it's it's just massive corruption, and it's like corruption at a, like a scale you can see like right in front of your eyes, but. There's a huge um, natural gas pipelines that, that they found, uh, natural gas reserves they found in the in the Amazon, and so there's just like insane floods of cash that are going to this region of the jungle of Cusco, and it there's some good things that happen, but most often that's just kind of like lost through the cracks, and the farmers don't really benefit. And a lot of times they'll be doing, oh, we'll do this big project, so they do like all oh, cacao renovation, and so like all the farmers they're like they know there's something special about chuncho, but like. 15, 20 years ago, all these engineers came, they're like, oh, you gotta plant the CCN 51, the cacao mejorado, like these are the better cacaos. And so a lot of them cut down their old chuncho plantation. They planted the CCN and all these hybrid varieties of cacao. And then, um, you know, they're still at the, at the whim of the international commodity market. And now it's like, people are like, oh, the chuncho is really good. And, and so now a lot of those farmers are going back and replanting the chuncho. Mm -hmm. And I do think, honestly, there is a certain benefit, at least in this region of Peru, of having some diversity. Because the chuncho harvest, this heirloom variety from that region, is January through April, May. Which is kind of nice, like all your harvest is focused on a specific time. The, some of these hybrid varieties will give cacao the whole year round. So like Rowan was saying, it has fruits and flowers. So you can harvest them all year round. The flavor is definitely not quite as good with some of those, and the cocoa butter, the fat content's not as high, so the texture's a little bit different. Um, so yeah, the government's always like a few steps behind. And, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's interesting that. And how does the USDA get involved with all this? You know, that was, it, it was just about the genetic bottleneck. Um, it, I think there was one guy at the USDA who really yeah, like chocolate right. is what it came down to. Like yeah. some guys so must have like written a grant or something. Because then, it, it, like you know, like it, in the United States, you can't grow cacao except for Hawaii. Um, so it's not really a U.S. product in a sense, but chocolate certainly is. Um, so for what the USDA decided that they didn't, they, they didn't want to see all these heirlooms disappear. But I think it must have been like some guy at the top. Who, and when, before, what was chocolate made out of when it was back in the you know fifties and sixties, and it was just Hershey bars? Yeah, so that was yeah. that was all coming from Africa, uh, pretty much, and it's it's like kind of like that CCN fifty one that Mateo. It's it's a high yielding variety that was picked for high yield. No attention was paid to how it tasted, literally yeah. none, because um, people didn't eat it dark enough 
to really notice in, in a way. Mostly not chocolate. Yeah, yeah it was just, like, yeah. And you know, something like a Hershey's bar doesn't actually have that much cacao in right. there. Um, so yeah, and it's just, it was just very cheap. And the, you know, what we call big chocolate, the big players, they, they're buying tens of thousands of tons at a time from a series of middlemen. There's like, there could be 12 middlemen from the original African farmer to the retail shelf, you know, with prices going down all along the way. So, uh, there, and, and it's a, you know, commodity market. So people at their computer terminals are buying and selling tens of thousands of tons. Um, so when, anytime you've got that kind of thing going on, the farmers are definitely the ones that get you know, left, cut out of the deal. As any farmers in the room can tell you. I wanted to ask Mateo, of your, all of these things that come together and what you're doing now, what would you say was your, your first sort of um, passion or love or interest is like farming, travel, culture, botany, Chocolate, like what was the the thing that started it, sort of for you? Would you say? I think it's a, yeah, it's a combination of the people and the farming. Yeah. So I I, st I after graduated college, I was I w did this. Do people know woofing? So worldwide opportunities on organic farms. I woofed in Oregon and Washington, and from my like little suburban mind was blown. I was like, and my heart was wide open. I was like, this is amazing. You're living on Where, the and where'd you go? I, I grew up in the Boston area. Okay. So I left in Oregon and Washington, and then I went down to Peru. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up in that region, Okobamba, just through all this series of coincidence. I played soccer with these people one day, kind of met them. I was like, oh, you could visit me wherever, whenever you want at this farm that I'm staying at. And then the next day, two of them roll up in their motorcycle, and they got a bag of cacao beans that they just harvested. Mm -hmm. And it's like really uh, super fresh uh, honeycomb that they had harvested as well from their farm. And they were like, this is how we make chocolate. And Toasted it and then peeled so it. So re relational. It. Exactly. It's a pe yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has a people, but I also love, like, I went down there with a love of the land and the plants and the ecosystem and, you know, wanting to do, you know, a good thing mm -hmm. just, you know, for myself, but, you yeah. know, naturally. Yeah. How did you get to Hardwick? And I get to Hardwick? Um, <laughs> through, through a couple friends that um, my partner at the time, Wasi, we came up visiting our friends. We had been looking all over for a place like in the countryside mm -hmm. to live and make chocolate because you don't you know, need to be in the middle of the city to make chocolate. And um, we were looking like Vermont. Originally, like just it felt like Vermont wanted to be in that place with the clean water and clean air and good food and good community. Um, but we didn't really find anything with the Maine, Western Mass, New Hampshire, North Carolina. Still didn't really quite find home. And then we were visiting our friends uh, for their wedding. And we stayed, and it was like, oh, this is super nice. And they were like, hey, we're having a baby. You want to come for the birth, like a home birth? And I was like, all right. Um, so we came. We ended up spending more and more time at their place in Hardwick. And then um, we were looking for a spot. And they were like, oh, I know that the, the co-op building was just uh, sold. So we got to figure out who owns that building now. And that's how it happened. Wow. Did, you, did what you studied in college have anything to do with all this or was this like a change in your life? You know, initially, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just like, I want to leave all that behind yeah. and just be on the plane and work yeah. on farming. But now looking back at it, I studied, uh, my major was marketing mm -hmm. and I had a minor <laughs> in uh, economics and international business. So, wow. um, I don't know how much it helped me, but like, it definitely, you know, uh, came yeah. back full circle. Yeah. But, you know, I kind of just like, for a long time, I was, um, I was like making, uh, just kind of following what I'm, you know, supposed to do, and then at a certain point, I was like, all right, major decisions in my life, I'm gonna make like based on what my heart tells me to yeah. do, and not use my mind to be like all these pro cons. And yeah. Should I do this? Should I do that? And I was like, no, I just need to go to Peru. I didn't really know why. And yeah. it's like, you just go there and trust. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the mind helps you figure out, you know, how it all fits together. I think it's amazing that you two got connected yeah. really now. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. like so, so you 15 minutes there. apart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then Erica discovered that show. That was Rowan's podcast. <coughs> oh, I thought they had learned yeah. that. They went to it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I guess. Oh, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll hop over there and sign a book for anyone who's interested. And Taya does have a